Hello again, this is Everard Junction and uh, this is sort of the first update on how the uh, extension is coming along. Uh, I've started my holiday now and I've been working quite hard over the last two or three days, uh, really motored into it. And as you can see, the right hand side of the layout has pretty much exploded. There's very little of what used to be there still around. So it's coming along quite well so far. Uh, basically, uh, to give you an idea of how much bigger it now is, uh, the old line, as you can see by the ballast there, used to come along here and it would enter the tunnel just after it went underneath this beam. So you were looking at sort of around where that uh, Quavers box is. That would be where roughly it ended. But now it goes all the way down there until the corner. So we've got about an extra six feet, pretty much. We've got uh, a two foot extension over here because the whole lot's moved back. And uh, because this board here has had to slide back into the corner, we've actually got a four foot extension at the end with this uh, six foot board. So in total, there's a six foot extension. So I'm very pleased with how much extra room there is. It really makes a difference. And uh, hopefully now I'll actually have a fiddle yard. And this is basically where it's gonna be. I'm planning to have uh, four tracks per main line as such. So uh, those of you familiar with the layout, there's three tracks that run around it. I'd like each one to have four storage spaces in a fiddle yard. So as you can see over there, we've got, I've just been uh, mocking it up but you can see each track has four separate tracks to go into. So I have loads of storage space for all the trains and more, which is very useful. I've uh, done a little bit of calculations as well, and it's just about big enough to fit a full length seven car HST in, which is a real bonus. So that means I'll be able to store the HST nice out of the way when it's not being used with all its carriages. Obviously it's only got three carriages at the moment, but I'm working on getting the rest. So yeah, that's pretty much where we are. Right, so if we come down to uh, this end of the layout, which uh, is quite dark now, I need to get another light mounted up there or something. Uh, basically, we've got a bit more space over here. Now that's going to be uh, where the helix is going to go. There's approximately a four foot space between here and the end of the house. And you can see the uh, bit of masking tape is where I've worked out roughly where the helix will end um, on its top level. So it should clear everything, it should fit okay. And I know quite a lot of you are curious as to how I make the helixes. I've received a lot of questions of how they're made, what's the measurements, how they're constructed. Uh, the only instructions I knew that existed have now disappeared. I tried to look for them the other day and the website's been taken down, so can't even get the measurements I'm using. So this will be a relatively moderately long video on how the helix are made. I'm not going to make the entire helix because it's the same process repeated over and over again but I'll show you one or two segments to give you an idea of how it's constructed and I'll give you a couple of dimensions as well. So far uh, the only problems really that I've experienced with the extension is uh, the unevenness of the floor. Uh, as you can tell by the lack of roof support this is a very old house and over the years it's really sagged in the middle. Uh, we've got brick wall over there at the end and then we've got the other side of the house here and the whole floor literally just soaks and sags down in the middle like that. It goes down by about an inch and a half so it's going to be difficult for me to give you any measurements with regards to the length of the actual legs because every single table leg has to be specifically made to a specific size uh, due to the unevenness of the floor. Um, so all I'll be able to give you really is uh, just how high the helix rises by each sort of quarter of a turn or half a turn. Um, I'll go into more detail when I actually start putting it together. Right, uh, here's a piece of the helix. Uh, this is just a quarter. Usually I use uh, half pieces, as you can see, there's the rest of it over there. Now basically this is quite easy to do. All you need to do is get a uh, four, four foot by four foot sheet of MDF, uh, thickness of your choice. Uh, I think this is 12 mil. It's relatively thick. Um, then get third fourth and second radius track or whatever radius is you're planning on using flexi track whatever you want to do and make three circles or two circles or if you've got a branch line just you know one circle maybe I don't know what you want to do um, and then just draw around it with a pencil leaving adequate, adequate clearance either side and then you'll get basically a donut on the, on the square and then just use a jigsaw and cut it out really and then you cut it into halves so once you've got all the bits of your helix uh, the second thing you need to do is to uh, get a mounting point to start the helix off. So we move the piece of helix out of the way. You can see here's uh, the little board here. Um, the previous helix didn't have this board. This little board is purely so that the corners uh, will actually finish nicely on the board because I've got the fiddle yard now. So 
instead of being all bunched together, they're spread apart. So naturally, they're going to they're going to encroach a little bit into the space. So I've had to make this little extension, but the principle is the same anyway. It's, it doesn't rise or anything. So what you need to do is you need to make sort of like a lap for the uh, edge of the helix to sit in. Now this is a good idea because then when you first start the helix off this will be your main reference point and it won't keep moving about whilst you try and mess around with legs and sizes and screws at the other end. Um, screw it down here, put a leg under it and then from there you'll have something that's relatively stable and you can work out your dimensions. Right, what I've uh, just done is uh, loosely assemble the uh, first half of the uh, bottom sort of circle. Um, all I've done is just screw on a leg uh, it's not the right length or anything, it's purely there just to hold stuff up at the moment. Uh, it'll be un, you know, unscrewed later and used on something else. Uh, so yeah, I've just screwed it onto the uh, the batten that uh, I was talking about earlier, uh, just temporarily with one screw. I've got to check a few things first before I commit to properly securing it to this part of the board. And then uh, basically I'll just uh, start putting the legs in. Obviously they all need measuring and making sure they're the right length. Now the uh, the general rule uh, for the helix, uh, certainly the rule that I use, um, some people do various different things, but it's basically what I do. Um, you always need adequate clearance for the trains, and I tend to find about three inches is about the right amount of height. So basically for every single full rotation, the uh, helix will rise by three inches. So once I join on another semicircle to that part and it comes around here, when it reaches here, it will be three inches above this current level. So for every half a turn it rises by an inch and a half and for every quarter of a turn it rises by about 0.7 of an inch and uh, that's pretty much it really. So uh, all you have to do is just for, for each quarter measure the height that you want the helix to rise by. Obviously if you want to go up a higher height then you can increase the gradient on the helix but you don't want to go too steep otherwise the trains won't actually get up it. Um, also, before I go any further, I would not recommend doing this if you're running a steam era layout. Uh, steam engines, as many of you know, have on average about six to eight driving wheels, and I've tried it, and it simply is not enough. They'll get up the helix unassisted, but if you put any more than two carriages behind them, they'll simply just get stuck halfway up or not even attempt to climb it at all. Um, all my diesels are at least eight or twelve wheel drive and uh, they're generally a bit heavier as well and they're much better at going up the gradients. Uh, some more modern steam engines, you know, they might do it, I don't know. The steam engines I've got are just a couple of the older uh, Backman sort of engines from about five years ago. Uh, some of the tooling on them is still used today but that's just a word of warning. So if you've got a steam layout I wouldn't recommend doing this particular helix method you'll need to use a lower gradient or a, a different circumference of uh, wood so you can get higher over greater distance. I'm not quite sure how you would do it. Uh, this only really works if you've got modern diesels. Right, just quickly uh, laid some track down and uh, just double checked uh, the measurements and as you can see we're looking good for entry into the fiddle yard. Uh, that's roughly how it'll work. I'll have a couple of curved points over here as well but uh, that'll be sort of in this bit. The bit I'm concerned about is sort of here so it's looking pretty good and uh, I'll just need to put a few straight bits in there that's not a problem. Uh, so now I'll uh, secure the helix onto this end with uh, probably three, three more screws and uh, then I'll start looking at uh, putting some legs on the other end and uh, making sure it all works. Right so uh, screwed it all in and uh, the first half is now in place. I um, should stress that it's extremely important that you get this particular piece of the helix right. Um, that's because all the other bits of it will uh, attach to it in some way. So if the uh, gradient is wrong anywhere, um, it will magnify itself to other parts of the helix. Uh, so for instance, if the end piece is too low, that then means when you attach the next piece around here, it's going to rise too steeply because it will be attached to that bit over there, which will be too low. And by the same token, if it's too high, the gradient here will be too steep and then the next piece will too be too shallow and you'll end up with uh, humps in the track where uh, the helix gradient alters slightly and that can cause uh, various problems with uh, stock and stuff uncoupling as well as wheels jumping off the edge of rails. So uh, it's very important you get it right. Uh, I think I've pretty much got it there as you can see. There is a nice gradient. It rises by an inch and a half 
and then by the time the second piece comes around it will be three inches above here and we'll have a nice bit of clearance so that's the next bit to do um, but before we can actually do that you're going to need to lay the track because once you put the next layer on it's going to cover up this bit here and it will also cover up a little bit of this bit and then you won't be able to lay the track so easy so it's actually better to lay the track as you make the helix and then when you get to here obviously you're going to need to lay the track on that bit because when the next bits go around it will loop over the top of it as well as when you bring the other baseboard in over here it's going to cover up the helix so you can't just build it and then just expect to have an easy time putting the track on because there's only going to be a gap of three inches between each layer so trying to get a hammer in there to put track pins in is uh, going to be impossible so always lay the track as you go right i'll put the uh, track in and uh, now it's time to put the uh, the next half on uh, this is where the construction method changes slightly and uh, we use threaded rod this can be bought in any DIY shop or anywhere, I think this stuff came from home base. And it's just threaded rod and some nuts, and then you can adjust the nuts depending on how high you want the gap between the uh, helixes to be. Uh, so I'm going to go for three inches, and uh, I'll adjust it roughly in the right area. Then put the uh, helix over the top and then adjust it further after that. And using the legs over there, it will uh, slot in, and then uh, I'll screw it to... Uh, this bit over here as well as the legs and uh, that will hold it up quite nicely and then all I have to do is put another leg in over that side where uh, the middle of it will be and once that's done all you have to do is just use the threaded rod to complete the process because there's always going to be a piece of wood underneath or wherever the helix goes from now on. Right I put on the uh, third bit which is uh, using the threaded rod so as you can see, threaded rod just comes up and supports the next piece. And it does the same when it goes to the uh, next quarter. And then as you go over there, there's a final piece of threaded rod. Uh, so all I need to do now is uh, just adjust the uh, distance between here by just undoing a couple of nuts. And uh, then it'll be uh, the right distance. Threaded rod is uh, really useful for this part of the helix because uh, if you want to do any adjustment, it's really easy. Uh, so there's a nut underneath this bit of wood here and at the moment it's a bit too high so all I have to do is turn a piece of threaded rod or nut and you can see that the uh, entire helix is descending so it makes adjusting it and getting the right distance between each bit really easy but again it's very important that the bottom piece that you put in first is exactly the right height and exactly the right gradient uh, because this piece is going to use the bottom bit as a template so if there's any imperfection on the top bit or the bottom bit it's going to be amplified on the top and the same goes for the uh, quarter bit that you put in over there to then transfer back to the baseboard you can have a bit of a, an issue if the bottom isn't correct right uh, it's almost finished now uh, it's pretty much there um, the final thing that i tend to do now with the helixes is i add an extra bit of support uh, halfway around each quarter uh, that just stops the uh, helixes from uh, sagging because you think about it you've got it secured here and you've got it secured there and it's a piece of wood that was originally flat and you're forcing it to bend upwards uh, so naturally it's going to sag here um, if you don't do that it's not a problem but after a couple of months you will notice uh, that the helix is starting to sag so I now add in these uh, support braces which just hold everything up and also maintain the three inch gap in between each layer um, seems to work quite well haven't had any issues with the, uh, the other helix over there which has uh, the same stuff and then finally the last thing you want to do is actually get down to uh, eye level at the helix and look at it carefully and uh, you'll be able to tell pretty, pretty quickly if there's any sort of issues with gradients anywhere as you can see it was careful when I assembled this and it seems to go up nice and smoothly uh, so, so the, the amount of problems we have when we actually start running the train should be uh, fairly minimal there will be a few issues as you would expect but nothing that can't be sorted with a bit of cork under the track and packing in a couple of places um, so hopefully this will, will work just as well as the last one did so uh, there you go really that's uh, roughly how to make a helix um, so I hope you enjoyed the video and just to recap uh, I use 12 mil thick MDF, it's 4 foot by 4 foot squares and then you cut a big donut out of the square and then cut that donut into halves or quarters depending on what you want to do. 
Uh, the spacing is achieved with a combination of threaded rod and uh, just pieces of timber cut to very specific sizes to maintain the gradient up the hill. And then the rest of it is just screwing it together, measuring it, checking levels with the spirit level and just making sure that it's going together right. Um, you'll be surprised that just getting down to eye level with it rather than using measurements is also a really good way to work out what the helix is looking like. Um, that was when I first noted the sagging. Once you got to eye level, you could see that it was drooping in various places. So uh, it's actually quite a good way of making sure it's the right uh, dimensions and stuff. Um, so I hope that's cleared a couple of things up with you. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, in the next part, I will be assembling the fiddle yard along this uh, massive stretch of board over here. I've got a huge amount of track on order from Hatton's. So I just need to wait for it to arrive.